All right. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, it's me, Jason Thomas, the insect hunter. I think some people came in a long time ago. They were here a few hours ago, um, dropping in some stuff with some questions and things. I don't ever really know how to start these things because it usually takes 30 seconds or so before somebody jumps in. So I don't know if I should just sit here and stretch or what it is I should be doing right now, but I'm here. We've got one person, so I'm gonna start off this stream. Um, I'll repeat this a little bit later, but whoever you are out there, out in the world, um, if you have any questions, I will take those at the end of the video. So um, if you have a question, um, just put in all caps, question, and then write your question. And after I get through the discussion, I will try my best to answer all the questions I can. We'll see how many people come in. If it's just one person, hey, I'll answer whatever question you want. Exciting. So um, I'll go ahead and get started. So um, the reason I'm making this video is because one of the biggest questions I always get on my channel is, why do you kill insects or why are you hurting those insects? You know, on the dragonfly one, I was not handling them perfectly um, the way that um, all researchers not all research, researchers, but a lot of researchers um, would say that you should. Um, but, you know, I do my best. There's no right or wrong answer of how you're supposed to handle insects or what is cruel and what is nice um, type of things. But, you know, we do our best. So, a lot of people ask about this, and I do kill insects sometimes. Uh, but I have to start off by just saying my personal opinion is that, yes, sometimes it is necessary to kill insects but there has to be a reason behind it. And my personal belief is that catch and release, um, that's what I enjoy doing the most, but sometimes it is necessary for research or educational purposes. So this discussion I'm gonna do is gonna be based on two different kind of uh, thought processes. Um, we're gonna talk about it first, morally speaking, like morally, is it right to kill insects even for research or for educational purposes? And then we'll also talk a little bit about um, like whether it's actually beneficial to humans uh, to do that, which is kind of a different thing. Like morally, like should I do it or should I not because it's not right versus, you know, ethically, um, scientifically, by scientific ethics. This is why I don't like doing live things, as you guys can see how much I stumble in my words. Um, I did do improv comedy a long time ago. Maybe I should... Just do some comedy on here and I'll do a lot better doing some acting and stuff like that. But anyway, so let's talk about it morally. Like, is it morally right to kill insects? So the first thing I wanted to talk about is, can we compare insects to humans? Like if someone kills a human, obviously people should be saying, no, that's bad, that's evil, that's wrong. But um, the first thing about insects is, can we compare humans to insects and, and are all animals equal um, on a spectrum? And uh, in my opinion, they're not. Um, so first off, insects, do they have brains? Sort of. Um, you know, with insects, they have kind of this, um, mem they have this uh, down their back along their neck. Um, I just need to get an insect out. I, I do better when I've got something in my hands. I can't really talk here with nothing. But anyways, I'm going to pull out one of my Madagascar hissing cockroaches. So insects, so here we go, we've got this hissing cockroach. So all along its back here, there is a bunch of, of cells that are like neural cells or uh, brain cells. And uh, they have all these cells in here. And uh, you think about a cockroach, um, they're not similar to a human. They don't have a brain, so they don't have the same senses um, to a degree as all of us. Those of you just joining us, um, if you have questions, keep those to the end. I will go through, and if you have question written in all caps, then I will go through and uh, answer those questions after I go through my discussion for those that are just joining, because we've got some more people here now. So anyways, what I was talking about is, is it morally right to kill insects? And the question was, do they have brains? Sort of. So I'm going to try and explain this one more time because I'm getting lost here. I've got some notes here to help me, and I think I probably need them. There we go. That's what I needed, that one note. So in insects, they have clumps of nerve tissue. So if we were to go along here, there's, whoop, don't wanna let that thing fall too much. Um, there's clumps of nerve tissue. There's a lot of it in, um, on the dorsal side. So, you know, up on here on the top, there's a whole bunch of uh, 
nerve tissues that are along there and then it spreads throughout their body. So that's why if we were to take this cockroach, and I'm not gonna do it right now because I'm not mean and I have no educational or research purposes to do it, I don't think it's worth doing. Uh, but if I were to chop off its head right now, um, it would still be able to move around and researchers have even found that insects can still to some degree detect light and react to things. Um, like with uh, fruit flies, quote, fruit flies, uh, which are actually vinegar flies, you know, drosophila. Um, they, without a head, they can mate and they can even fly to a certain degree. And they're some of the ones that will react to light. So if you use light on them, they will kind of react to it without even having a head at all. There's no eyes, there's no real sensory coming in, but somehow they're able to react to it. I mean, that's just awesome because you know, insects, their brain, rather than having it in one central location, is kind of just this clump of nervous cells, um, nerve cells just all throughout their bodies, mostly here along the dorsal side. But anyways, yeah, I mean, even with cockroaches, they can, they can live without their head for like two weeks. And the reason for that is because, first off, um, they have spiracles, so they're able to breathe. Um, they've got all these tiny little holes in their body that they can breathe out of. So without their head, you know, with us, we, we can't really breathe or uptake oxygen very well. Um, and then also blood loss because they can clot. So if I were to cut off this cockroach's head right now, um, it would just clot off the top. That, that would all be clotted off. It'd be um, unable to bleed out. But with us, we just would lose so much blood and we could not clot that large of a location and that much blood coming out. Not trying to get too graphic here, but I mean, yeah. So... So I don't know. That's that, that's one of the things that I think about it is, I mean, they're, they're, they're definitely not the same as humans. You can't compare them to even like a dog or something because they don't have the same type of nervous system. They can't experience emotions, in my opinion, to the same degree. But that's kind of debatable. Um, a lot of uh, some researchers have started looking at bees and whether they have emotions. And they tested whether the bees could learn to associate colors um, with feeding, and so they assumed or kind of described the bees getting excited, but I, I still don't feel like insects have emotions to the same degree as humans do. Um, so that's kind of the moral side of it. It's how much suffering are we causing them? Um, and to that degree, I don't know. And that, that to me is almost kind of thrown out of the equation because we still don't know and we're not 100% sure. So now let's just talk about whether it's right to kill insects for educational or research purposes. If your argument is moral, then I can understand that. But um, on the side of education and research and what it can give to us, I think there's a really good argument that we need to be um, studying them and that sometimes it's necessary to kill them. So first off, whether insects are treated as the same level as animals on a university level, um, they are not treated the same. So um, when I worked at Texas A&M, I did research on insects. So I would do different tests. We can test like, hey, let's put a whole bunch of predators with a whole bunch of pests and see if they killed each other and what happens. Or take ants, like, you know, I, we go out and gather a whole ton of ants out in the wild, they're wild species. We take them, we put them in containers and we poison them. We, we put different pesticides in there to see what happens to them and if that kills them. That research was, like instantly approved. You did not even have to have any special protocol to be able to do that, you know? It's a wild species out in the wild, but if I were to go and, you know, even just capture a squirrel and put it in a cage, um, the, the university would have been freaking out, and that's, that's kind of how they're treated. You know, insects versus mammals versus humans versus primates. I think kind of in their hierarchy, from what I've noticed um, doing training, on, on research on different insects and animals and things like that. The hierarchy is kind of like um, arthropods are like the lowest. Uh, obviously, probably plants are lower. You can do whatever you want to plants and nobody's really going to care. You know, uh, they, they in some ways have senses too. So are we being mean to them? But I don't know. Plants are probably like lowest, probably goes up to arthropods, so like insects, maybe crustaceans, things like that, spiders, stuff like that. So, and then from there you go up, um, if you have questions, make sure and mark it with a cat box with questions, and at the end I will um, answer some questions. So, um, uh, get lost here really quick with all these comments, you guys. 
You guys can keep commenting. I'll try to ignore them. Sorry, but I'll look at them at the end. Um, so anyways, the hierarchy. So we go from arthropods, or sorry, plants, arthropods, and then we would get maybe into like birds and mammals and then primates and then humans. So if you want to do testing on humans, you are going to have to fill out tons of paperwork and it's going to be really hard to be able to do research on them because you've got to have all these approvals and all these people have to look at it and make sure that what you're doing is sound and not going to like kill people or hurt people or have emotional scars. And then um, from there, kind of down with primates, you have to do almost just as much work because um, they're perceived as being very similar to humans um, to a certain degree. And so they have kind of emotions, they have these uh, social things going on. And so with, with every layer of those, you have to have more approval, but with insects, I could get something approved without even asking somebody. If I wanted to go out and just capture some insects, as long as they're not endangered or um, like a super significant pest, I can't be hauling those around the country. But if I'm gonna do a test like that, um, it, it just gets approved very quickly. So, but anyways, um, the reason I'm doing a lot of this animal uh, testing training and stuff and why I know about this is because uh, one of my recent projects that I work with is barn owls and so someone got really confused when I told them that they're like what is a now I was like uh, because I was telling about these birds that eat mice um, so that's what I'm studying one of the things I'm working with right now I know it's not insects but I work with barn owls a guy he's like what is a now I've never heard of a now before because I guess I just say it too fast I'm like hey yeah I work with barn owls and maybe I'm just saying it wrong I don't know but anyways, so with my research, what I do is we're building boxes for barn owls to live in, and then they will come live in these boxes, and between them and their offspring over a growing season, they'll feed on about 2,000 uh, voles, which are kind of like a field mouse, which feed on crops and cause damage and are just a big issue here in Idaho. So in order for me to only look inside of the barn owl box, so if I want to just stick a camera inside of that box, if I want to clean that box, I have to go through this huge process and get approval just to do that because it's a barn owl, it's not an insect. If it was an insect, if I want to go poke an uh, ant's nest and just see what happens, I can go do that and the university, they're not going to care. They're going to be like, who cares, you know, two-year-olds are doing that. But when it comes to barn owls and wildlife that are of a higher level according to um, science, and I don't know whether that's wrong or not, but as that happens... Um, it just makes uh, the research harder to do and harder to get into. And I do think it should be that way because um, a barn owl um, has more emotions in my, in my opinion. I, I could be wrong, but um, yeah, I think, uh, I think that that kind of sums that up. But I want to kind of give you guys some, some more examples. So those things that I was talking about, those are called institutional boards. So... Um, here at the University of Idaho, um, it's called the Animal Care and Use um, Committee, I believe. I, I cook the Institute of Animal Care and Use or something committee. And so if I want to do anything with animals, even if it's like calves or horses or deer, whatever I want, any kind of animal other than insects or arthropods, I have to go through an Animal Care and Use Committee. And people have to review my work. I have to pre-approve everything if I'm going to go and even just observe birds. It's like, if I'm gonna just go bird watching, I have to have approval for some reason. But with insects, you know, you can, you can do just about anything. If you guys have questions, remember, um, save them to the end, uh, or you, you can ask them now, but just put it in caps locks, say question, and then type out your question at the end, I will answer questions, okay? Um, so, Here's some reasons why I think killing insects or causing some harm to them is essential in education and research, in my opinion. So I'll give you some different examples. But I already told you guys, my preference is to catch and release because I mostly am catching them for the adventure and the excitement of just seeing what it is. It's like, I'm like a fisherman. I'm not out trying to catch the fish to eat them because I'm starving and dying, but I do it because I enjoy looking at them and seeing them and knowing what kind of fish, or in this case, insects are out there because I just like learning. Um, because, you know, in my opinion, I do think we need to respect the environment, but sometimes it's necessary for things to die. I mean, it's going to happen. It, it just will. So here's one example with mosquitoes. Um, so let's think about mosquitoes. In 2015, um, 438,000 people were killed 
by malaria, which is a disease transmitted by mosquitoes. So, um, researchers are rearing in the lab, rearing, sorry, researchers are rearing them in the lab and killing them. Like, they're, like, people, if this was, like, a human or a chimp or, like, a bird, people would be freaking out because they're doing genetic testing on them, they're messing with their genetics to try and see if they can make the mosquitoes infertile when they go out so that all the mosquitoes are infertile or they're taking them and just exposing them to all of these chemicals and just trying to see how well they can survive these different chemicals or um, putting them with predators that just rip them to shreds and kill them and are just eating millions of these mosquitoes. Is that right? Is that wrong? I, I mean, what about those 483,000 people that were killed? Did they have a choice in the matter? I mean, if we have to kill some insects or kill some sort of animals in order to preserve humanity, then I think it's worth it. I mean, those people didn't have a say. So I think they should, um, I think it's important to have to kill things. I mean, it's, it's not like we want to. It's not like we're going and killing all these mosquitoes because, oh, I just really hate mosquitoes. And I just think they're ugly. No, it's because they transmit diseases. That's one disease that mosquitoes transmit. There's Tons of other diseases. Go to, CDC, go to the CDC website, the Center for Disease Control, and you will learn about all the mosquito-related diseases and all the harm it causes to humans in the United States and all over the world. The United States is hardly anything compared to, like, Africa and other places. So, I, I don't know. I, I'm not trying to diss on anybody that says, why are you hurting insects? And, and I try not to when I, when I don't have to, but at the same time, there's people dying out there. How Do we just say, eh, we can't hurt them? because they're natural and they're in the environment. No, they, it's not like we are just after them. It is, it, it, it's them. They have basically come to war with us as humans. And it's not like I'm saying that that's what they were meant for or why they're here, but I mean, they, they've kind of uh, laid their hand and they're causing issues and we'll do the best we can to survive as humans. And I'm not trying to be selfish and say it's, we're just doing it for humans. You know, those mosquitoes can spread diseases to other animals, too. So, I mean, that has to happen sometimes. Um, and here's, here's another example with the mosquitoes. Like, if there's tons of mosquitoes showing up in your house, I had somebody with my mosquito that I killed um, in that video I made a few weeks ago. They said, why did you kill that mosquito? Like, what's the point in that? Everybody, looks like we got some more people. If you have questions... Uh, for me, at the end of the video, I'll take questions. Just put them in caps locks, say caps locks uh, in capital letters, question, and then write your question at the end. I'll go through the comments and look at all those and answer people's questions if they want. But um, anyway, so somebody on my video I made a few weeks ago uh, about taking pictures of insects, they got upset that I killed a mosquito to take pictures of it and to teach people about it. But you think about if you're starting to see, and this is a real world situation, that mosquito came from somebody's house and I literally went to their house and in their bathroom, there was like three or four of these. And they said that they've seen like hundreds of these mosquitoes, like in the dozens, they just keep showing up in their house. If you start seeing a ton of things that look like mosquitoes in your house or just tons of insects in general, if something's coming into your house, do you not want to know what it is? And to take one of those mosquitoes, you know, I, I caught it in a jar, but it's flying around all over the place. I can't, I cannot see what's going on with it. With the identification with a lot of these insects, you have to sometimes look at like their reproductive organs, or you have to dissect them, or you have to look at really close up things on their wings. It's just not possible. Um, I, I don't know why the folks got so upset about it. I mean... I understand that we shouldn't just kill things willy-nilly. I wasn't just making the video because, hey, I just am out to get mosquitoes and I happen to be filming. No, I really believe that people need to take better pictures of insects so they can send them to people like me or other extension educators or extension agents so they can, so, so they can learn what's in their house, whether it's good or bad. We need to understand the insects around us that will help us be better humans and just do better in our lives because the more we understand, the better we'll do. So another example is termites. So every time people ask me like about my job and they wonder like, why are you an entomologist? You know, I always tell them the joke. There's this joke, it goes, what do you call a zoologist with a job?
I'm sure there's quite a bit of lag, so you guys aren't even going to be able to guess what the answer is. The answer is an entomologist, and the reason for that is because there's so much money in insects. They cause so much damage and so much harm. And I'm not trying to diss on people that like other animals, that like birds and like mammals and like things like that. I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about most normal people. To them, birds, mammals, a squirrel, you know, whatever, it's deer, things like that, you know, they don't really cause them that much harm and they're not that big of a deal. I'm not trying to diss on those animals because I think they're important and they play an important ecological role, but I'm just saying to the general public, if some bird species disappears, most people are not really going to care about that because they don't really interact with humans and they don't cause us that much harm. But with insects, you take one species like termites. And so according to Orkin's website, just termites, that's just one group of insects. According to Orkin's website, $30 billion of damage is caused by termites and similar species to crops and houses each year. I think most of the money is in the houses because having your house, you know, all your wood that your house is built out of just getting destroyed and crumbling beneath you, that is a big issue. That's a lot of money, you know, having your house collapse on you. That's a that's a huge huge issue. So, you know, researchers are raising them in labs and they're experimenting on them, not because, hey, let's just poke these termites and see how they react. Ooh, sounds fun, really cool. You know, it's not that. It is We've got to try and survive and we've got to find applied solutions and applied means real world solutions, things that help us, not just learning about science just to learn about it. Because, you know, a lot of people think that researchers are just doing things just because they wonder. It's like, hmm, I wonder, uh, why does the ants antennae move this way? Let's just kill a bunch of them and see why. No, and I've met scientists like that. I don't agree with that. I believe that we need to do research that's applied that will help humans and help us better survive and uh, take care of our families and enjoy life, you know? So, so I don't know. I feel like uh, that's another good example. Another example is a person. So, the, so I've talked about bad insects so far. Um, one of the one of the good insects so you think about good insects so you guys have hopefully seen the surfid fly video that's the it's like a worm with like these hook jaws in it it's totally blind and just goes around and just destroys aphids um the surfid fly larvae um and ladybugs so one of the people that i worked with at texas a&m they were studying those and they were trying to learn um if you guys have a question uh make sure and put in caps locks question and then write your question and at the end, I will take questions. Um, once I wanna get through all this though, I don't wanna to get too distracted. So my friend that was working at Texas A&M, she was studying these predators. Um, she wasn't studying them just for the heck of it, but she was studying them in order to um, learn how to better use these to fight aphids. So they eat a lot of aphids. There's a big pest in Texas, it's called the sugarcane aphid. I'm sure any of you that have looked through the videos on my channel, you'll see some videos about the sugarcane aphid. They're not super well viewed because most of the public don't really know about them. But anyways, these aphids cause millions of dollars of damage um, in sorghum every year. Um, so what happens is these predators will eat these aphids, but if we don't know about the predators, how can we support them? So in order for us to know what the predators are, uh, this person had to dissect some of them and had to actually kill some of them. They're, they're good insects. We need them alive to help fight bad insects, but she had to kill them so that she could figure out what the exact species was. Because when you have the exact species, you're able to make uh, better inferences about them. Because let's say that I study these predators and somebody else is studying them and they're finding out all these cool things. How do I know if what I'm studying is the exact same thing? Because if I can just take what they've already done and apply it to mine, that's perfect. But you have to actually sometimes kill these things in order to do that because you have to look at really finite parts you can't have them moving around. You've got to look at things like that. And with those ones, I mean, it was almost impossible from what I heard to identify these things. I mean, it would be impossible if you did it um, with a live one because you had to look at, um, you had to dissect their jaws or their reproductive organs or something like that to see what was going on or, or which, which species they are. So sometimes it's even necessary to kill insects that are good insects not because we want to, but because we need to learn about them. 
So I talked with two different people. Well, somebody sent me an email. Um, I appreciated that email. I think it was Avery. I'm sorry if I messed up your name there. But um, sent me an email about something, and then I also talked with a systematist. And for my discussion with them, I got into a few different things. So I'll talk about what um, Avery sent me, and the systematist talked about this too. A systematist is a person. Um, um, they... Their job is to understand the parts of the body of the insects and species and break them up uh, into their groups. And uh, systematics, it's basically like looking at the different parts of the insects and kind of how they change over time. And then also, I think he was a taxonomist as well, um, who is like studying different species, what makes this species different from this species, etc. So, um, my, my friend Avery, what she said to me is she said, uh, well, I guess she's my friend. I don't know. She just emailed me randomly. You're my friend now, Avery. Welcome to the club. Um, <laughs> she said uh, that there was this big debate, and I talked with the other guy about this, about a couple years ago. This guy tried to submit a new species of insect, and he tried to do it by just using a picture. So he just got a picture of, of this insect, like this rare Bombaliid fly or something. I think it was some sort of uh, digger bee or something, and uh, or it was a type of fly. But um, oh, it looks like we got an invader here. Uh oh. Cockroach. You seeing the cockroach? I'm holding. You want to hold it? Okay. I guess we got to have a quick break here and <laughs> keep him until my wife comes and gets him. What's this? Cockroach. Do you like it? Is it cute? Did it get you? Yeah. Is it cute? Oh, got it on the floor. I'm sure my wife doesn't like that. Go find mommy, okay? You say bye-bye? Bye-bye. Say hello, world. Say hello, world. Hi, girl. Okay. All right, you better go with mommy. Okay, back to the discussion. Sorry about that. So, I keep getting very sidetracked here. Sorry, guys. Anyways, so... I'm just gonna redo the whole thing because we got a little, uh, a little lost there. So a couple years ago, a researcher who researches different types of flies found a new species of fly, and he took pictures of it. And he was trying to capture it, but somehow it flew. And will you please help with him? Sorry, guys. He wants to see the cockroaches, guys, but we got to keep this discussion going here. Okay, maybe we'll do better if he just sits here and he can look at them. But anyways, this guy, he was studying flies, and he took a picture of this really cool, rare, new species of fly. And he tried to catch it in a jar, but it got lost, and he couldn't actually keep a physical specimen of it. Now you guys know who's in charge of our house. So he didn't get the actual specimen. So what he did is he tried to submit a new specimen um, to the scientific community for a view to be added as a new specimen. But all he had was a picture and scientists just blew up. It just caused like this explosion of people getting angry about it and upset. Because just using a picture of something, is that enough to prove that the species exists? And then that that's all you have. So if someone finds something that looks similar, how do you know if it was the same thing or not? Because you can't look at certain parts of its body. All you can do is look at this one shot of part of its body. So I, I have to agree for the most part with most of the scientific community on this because, I mean, you could Photoshop it, you could change it, and you could make your own species. You could put pieces of things together and make it look really realistic, you know? And so I don't think using a picture is is the best way to describe a species. And the, fo the, the guy that I talked about that's a taxonomist, he actually works at the Smithsonian Museum. Um, and, and he told me, he's like, we have to have voucher specimens. So what, a, sorry, voucher specimens. What a voucher specimen is, is a voucher specimen is you take and you preserve a specimen if you guys don't like listening to me, you can enjoy watching my son play with this. Um, voucher specimen is a preserved specimen that you keep and you use it as like the type. Like this is the example. This is the example of 
what uh, so a Madagascar hissing cockroach looks like. So they have one sample there, and you can look at it, and you can look at all the parts of its body, and if someone wants to know if they have a Madagascar hissing cockroach, they can um, send it to them. You'd have to have some special permission and make sure it gets the right person. I mean, it, I'm not, it's not that easy, but you could get it to them and say, is this a Madagascar hissing cockroach, the one that I found? And they could look at whatever you found and uh, compare it to what they have on record as like the main example. And then they will tell you if it is a Madagascar hissing cockroach or not. So that's what a voucher specimen is. And that's important um, for you to have in order to prove that a specimen is actually a different species and things like that. So, all right, buddy, do you want to go find mommy? No, you just want to keep playing with the bug? Okay. Okay. We keep losing people coming in and out and they're like, what the heck is this? Is this the baby bug hour? Um, so anyways, that's what he said. And then him and I also had an interesting discussion about Charles Darwin. So if you guys don't know the story about Charles Darwin, he's kind of where the origin of natural selection and evolution kind of came a very, um, important scientific theory that, um, we have to understand why things adapt and evolve and change over time. But part of his work and why he started to think about this is because he looked at finches on the Galapagos Islands. So what he saw is that some finches had like bigger beaks, longer beaks, wider beaks, and he kind of made these assumptions about them that, well, these ones with these bigger beaks eat nuts more, and he kind of found correlations with the different plants and things on the different islands and how, how there was different food sources in each place. Okay, do you want to go find mommy? No. So, come go with mommy. Come help mommy. Go help. I need to wash his hands. So anyways, he, he found all these findings about finches but he could not have actually measured their beaks if they were alive. Like for him to measure the beaks of tons of different species, he couldn't have done it if he had not killed them. So he actually killed a bunch of, bunch of specimens and took them back with him to put them in a museum. And with birds and mammals and things, they're actually type specimens too. So they're these specimens that are like preserved so you can like look at the different, like their bone structure or their feathers or their fur and things. They've been preserved over time so that you can look at, well, this specific type of finch looks like this because we have this specimen. And if someone else claims that it's something different, we can take ours and compare the two and look at them. And if they're exactly the same in, in the parameters that we have, uh, we can say, oh, well, that, that's a, those are the same uh, finch there. So um, trying to think if there was anything else I was going to talk about, another example. I think that was all the examples that I had, but I mean, if, if Charles Darwin had not killed those birds, he may not have come out with that, that theory of evolution if he had not looked really closely at them to see, because the, the differences were not like things you notice, you know, from a distance, just observing the animals, like their beaks, it, it's, you know, a couple inches difference, it's like a couple inches difference in the beaks, like just a little bit longer, a little bit wider. Those meant a huge difference um, in the evolution of those birds and what island they were on. He could not have observed that if he hadn't killed them. And so, like I said earlier, you know, the main point to me with killing insects is, is there a purpose behind it? Because, you know, I don't just kill things just for fun. I'm not going out capturing dragonflies because, because I've got something against them or because I think, oh, I'm entitled. I can just catch whatever I want and do whatever I want. No, it's because I want to educate people and help people see these things up close so they can get excited about it so that they're willing to research them and look for them and try to help out the research community and educate other people. If you've seen a dragonfly up close, you can tell people about it and how awesome they are. And maybe that person will think twice when they spray pesticides um, you know, I just want people to understand that we aren't just killing things willy-nilly. If, if I do something for work or if I ever have to take the life of something, I, I think about it seriously. I think, well, is, is there a need for this? Do I really have to do this? Like, I, I saw some wasps outside of my house. You know, I, I don't necessarily want to kill them, but my son getting stung by them because he will just poke everything and has to see everything and touch everything, they might get stung by him and have him irritated and then throw off our day for some reason because he's crying all day because he's got hurt and it might not last that long but you know I think we need to 
um, think about things like that. But my opinion is catch and release is the way to go as much as you can, but sometimes it is necessary to kill things. So if you guys have any questions, I'll kind of take a look here to see, look through the comments. Let's see here. All right, let's see if it'll let me scroll through the chat. Oh, nice. Okay, I'll start at the first here, and I don't know if all these questions were for me or if they were for between each other or something. All right, had some interesting conversations. Lopez Creations, bonjour. I don't know much French, but awesome. Um, let's see here. Oh, it looks like Dave is in, was in a class watching this video. Hopefully it was an uh, entomology class. Let's see here. Strepsiptera. I'm trying to remember. Is the Strepsiptera, are they the flies that have the really weird... Uh, the Strepsiptera, yeah, I think I remember those. They have really weird wings. They're very strange. I have never collected those before. I've seen specimens, but they're like super rare. I've I've only met a couple people that have ever even collected them, and that's like out of, you know, hundreds of researchers and people that I've met. Like, they're just super rare. Hey, Raymond, how are you? Um, let's see here. Let's see. What do I think about parasitic wasps? I think parasitic wasps are pretty dang cool. I think it's awesome. I really like hyperparasitoids. I just think it's so cool that they're kind of... If you know what hyperparasitoids are, so parasitic wasps, they go in and they lay their eggs inside of different um, pests for the most part, things that are feeding on plants like a caterpillar. The wasp will come in, paralyze it, or sometimes just lay their eggs in it, and they even inject viruses in there which can control their minds and get them to do things, which is just super awesome. Um, but hyperparasitoids, they will go in and they'll look for things that have been parasitized, so things that have things living inside of them because uh, these wasps will grow on the inside of the body and they'll, then they'll eat the insect alive eventually. And these hyperparasitoids, they come in and they will detect the parasite inside of the insect and they will lay their egg into, not into the caterpillar, we'll say for this example, but into the larvae that are inside of the caterpillar. So they can smell that there's a larvae in there and they'll get their um, ovipositor into there and lay the egg into the larvae that's inside of there. I just think it's so awesome that they kind of, they depend on other parasites. If the parasites didn't exist, they wouldn't exist either because they're so um, specialized. Let's see here. Yep, my son is cute. He can be a monster though sometimes. Uh, Cheese the Cowfish B. I, I really want to meet Cheese the Cowfish A. I'm, I'm really wondering who they are. But have you ever met him before? <laughs> oh, let's see here. Yeah, you got to start them young, Raymond. They, they're uh, they're a lot of fun. He he's uh, my son is very has mixed emotions about insects. He my wife is scared to death of them and doesn't like them. And then my son always sees me and I love him, so he like loves them. And then he's like scared of them and he doesn't know what to think because he's just kind of confused because uh, my wife and I give him mixed messages. Let's see here. One of my mantises died, it head stopped moving, then it died the next day. Yeah, um, for the most part, if insects lose their head, it's usually a hydration issue. That's why they can't survive, because they have no way to rehydrate themselves. You hold me. You hold me. You hold me. I'm going to hold you? Yes. Um, but yeah, let's see here. <laughs> let's see. Okay. Yeah, we'll hold it in a minute. Okay, here you go. Okay. What's the best insect you've captured? Um, oh, don't touch. I think the best insect I've captured, oh, man, I don't know. I, I think that scarab beetle larvae that I found while I was um, digging in rotting logs, just because I've had people that have lived in Texas their whole lives and they've never seen those before. I just thought that was so awesome to find that. Like that was like heart stopping, like adrenaline pumping in my body. Like what in the heck is this thing moment when I found that? I thought that was pretty dang awesome. Clognog. Have you
have you seen the guy who's been making videos of him getting stung? Yeah, Coyote Peterson, uh, Brave Wilderness. Yeah, I've watched some of his videos. I think he's pretty funny and I think it's interesting to watch. I, I think people just enjoy watching him being in pain. But for the most part, I think most people are kind of, he's trying to help people understand that they won't normally hurt you and stuff, but at the same time, he is still kind of reinforcing the let's be scared of insects notion. So I, I don't know what to think about it. I think he over dramatizes a little bit. If I ever get stung by one of them, then maybe I'll tell you what it feels like. Um, but he, he seems a little dramatic to me because that's what it is. It's kind of trying to be dramatic with a little bit of education in there too. Okay, we, got, we got to put it away. It's got to go to sleep. Cockroaches got to sleep too. Okay, let's see here. Uh, this is off topic. Do you have any tips on writing small? I have big, terrible handwriting and the oversized labels I have to use make my collection messy. Would typing out labels be better? Yes, for sure. Just um, put it into a Word document and print them off and then you might have to tweak it over time, little by little, to find the right size. But I think it's like two point font. Like it is small. I can, uh, if you send me an email, Aspen Entomology, um, send me an email at theinsecthunter at gmail.com and I will try and send you a message with my template that I use. And uh, you can use that to see how, how small I do my font, but it's like really small font because most of the time people are not reading it. The people that are reading it have magnifying glasses or can read it in some other way. Oh, I gotta talk to the people right now, okay? Can you go help mommy? No. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's see here. Can we see my stick bugs? Um, they're actually at my office. I don't have them with me here right now. I'd be glad to bring them out, but they're at my office right now. Um, I don't have them here at the house yet. Maybe you guys need to talk to my wife and convince her to let me have them here. No. She just said no. <laughs> Question, have you seen a giant water bug in real life? One that's alive? Um, I've not seen one that's alive. The one that I have in my collection, it landed on my in-law's porch. So I thought that was uh, pretty, uh, pretty interesting that that landed on their porch and then I added it to my collection. They, they caught it for me and kept it. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, I understand that Brave Wilderness is trying to do research on the best, on the worst sting. I definitely think it's uh, important. <laughs> Do I have anything here to show you guys? Well, it just depends what you guys want to see and what my wife will let me show you because we're in a new house. We're still getting things cleaned and up and running. Um, hold on just a second. I'm going to get a drink. If you guys have more questions, come up with a couple more questions, and then when I come back, I'll answer those. If you think of something you want me to show you, I, I don't know what you want to see. Do you want to see my kitchen sink? Do you want to see my bathroom? What do you want to see? I'll be right back. I'm going to get a drink. Okay, all right, take a couple questions and I think we'll wrap up because this is going a little long here, but I'm glad to interact with you guys and talk with you guys. What is the biggest moth you've ever seen? Um, I caught, a, it's a, the family is Saturnia Day, I'm trying to remember what they're called, Luna Moths? I can't remember. Um, I, I was out collecting insects one day, it was in a forest in Texas and I was just walking around looking for insects and on the ground was this perfectly pristine, untouched, like perfect moth just sitting on the ground. And I was like, okay, is this thing dead? Is this alive? And I coaxed it into a jar and it was actually, um, it was actually alive. I was like, what in the heck? Um, so I thought that was pretty interesting. And I just thought it was a very beautiful moth. It was kind of a reddish one. I think it's in one of my videos. I don't have my collection here. It smells too much like mothballs, so my wife's like, no, you're not gonna have that around here. So maybe I could put it in the garage sometime. But yeah, I could bring it on for one of these for just a little bit. I don't know if it was an atlas moth. It wasn't that, it wasn't as big as that, but it was probably, it's hard to know how big, how big my hands are, my face at the other, that me in person. But yeah, it was probably about this big. 
I think Atlas moths are like really big. Do you have any tips on caring for beetle grubs? I usually put them in plastic jars with holes on the sides with an edible substrate made up of wood, compost, and such, but they end up dying before pupating. I haven't had a ton of experience working with beetles. I have kept alive a cerambicid beetle, that really big longhorn beetle I have. That thing has been alive for like, I don't even know, like four or five months. I've had that just sitting in a jar, not a jar, but just a plastic container with the dirt in there. And then I just, what I did is I took some of the trees that I found it off of. It was feeding on kind of an old, somewhat dying olive tree. So I cut off some of the branches and tried to gather some roots and things. Tried to just put that there with it. So I think the key thing with trying to keep insects alive is if you can find what they were feeding on and get more of it. It's like with caterpillars. If you find a caterpillar on a tree, most likely that's the tree it was trying to eat or that it was, that the egg was laid on. So you try to collect those leaves and use those leaves to um, feed it and keep it alive. So I, I would try to find beetles, um, beetle larvae, and find what they're on. Like, what are they feeding on? Like, was it like on some roots of some tree or something? Then try to gather some roots of that tree and put it in there with them. And then maybe they'll have a better chance of living. Um, I don't know. It's really hard to keep the humidity right. You know, you bring something inside and then trying to keep it the right humidity can be a challenge. And also temperature sometimes, because sometimes for them to pupate, they need to get colder um, and then they need to get warmer again. And kind of simulating that can be an issue, but I'm not an expert on raising beetle larvae by any means. Well, sounds like everybody's just kind of chatting about a whole bunch of other things. Well, I appreciate you guys joining me for this. Uh, if you guys enjoyed it, give me a like and uh, let me know whether the quality was pretty good. I'd like to know that too. Those of you that stayed all the way to the end of this, wow, you guys are true insect hunters. You guys have earned your insect hunter badge. You're, you're working your way up to become an insect hunter pro. So Thank you guys for watching and uh, like and subscribe and click the bell so that you're notified when I do another live video. I'll try to do another one of these in, I don't know, a, cu a couple weeks, maybe a month or two. I don't know. It just depends. Um, when I get really busy, I try to uh, just do a stream and have a discussion with you guys. And it gives you guys a chance to ask questions live and just kind of get to know me and uh, some of the stuff I do. But I appreciate you guys and all the learning we get to do, get to do together. And I'm excited to chat with you guys again sometime. We will talk with you guys later. Thank you. Everybody have a great evening. I'll probably say something before, but have a happy holiday too. Excited for that. So I'll see you guys.